uh, please tell us how many students you have in each grade. So our grades, we can go sixth grade right now, we have 82. In uh, seventh grade, we have 99. In our eighth grade, we have 112. In our sixth grade, excuse me, our ninth grade, we have 69. In our 10th grade, we have 55. In our 11th grade, we also have 65, excuse me, and our current senior class is 47. And so right now we are serving uh, close to 527 girls uh, this school year. Do you have other questions that came to you, Siobhan? I did not. Okay. Great. Well, we have a question here. Um, what is your dropout rate? So a dropout rate for a five-year cohort, it has been less than 5%. And do you have, um, do you follow up with the girls that end up leaving your school? Do you, do you know why uh, they, they leave? So the eighth graders, when they transition to high school, some want the co-ed experience, right? And some want more of a, what they call a traditional Baltimore City school experience. So when we typically lose girls at the eighth grade level to go to other high schools, it's either family uh, tradition, you know, my mom, dad, they may have gone to a, a larger Baltimore City high school and that's our family tradition. Others have left because once again, they want to experience high school in a co-ed environment. Uh, we have had students who have left because, of course, their families may have relocated outside of the city limits or outside of the state. For students uh, who have left our school for other reasons, it had, they have included having to go to an alternative option program. So if we recognize that the girls are not accumulating credits in the way that they should in order to graduate on time, we definitely work with Baltimore City Public Schools to identify a school that can provide an accelerated option for them to earn those credits. Thank you. Um, we have a good question. Uh, actually, they're all good questions. Uh, how has COVID affected your year? Uh, have you had challenges with technology and everything else? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think we are hearing one of my tech challenges right now, but uh, in the late spring, uh, our board launched a pretty aggressive campaign called Laptops for Learning. When we knew that we were going to receive uh, funding through the CARES Act and through a few other acts, uh, we knew that the laptops were going to be available, but we just wanted a bit more flexibility in terms of when we would receive them. And if we all remember, if for those of you who have children or grandchildren in schools, trying to secure a device in the late spring and early summer, it was almost the equivalent to the Hunger Games is what we called it. So we needed a bit more flexibility to, uh, to go wherever we could find the devices. So our board launched a pretty aggressive campaign uh, to ensure that every single one of our girls by the start of the school year, they had a device, either a laptop if they were in high school or a Chromebook if they were in middle school. And then we also worked with families to provide hotspots for families who were uh, experiencing connectivity issues. So if families needed them, we ensured that they, we fundraised in addition to the CARES Act funding to ensure that every girl had a device and a hotspot with a data plan. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, can you tell us about your STEP dance program? Okay, so our STEP team uh, it is a high school or upper school team that girls can join beginning in their sixth, in, excuse me, in their ninth grade year. The STEP team, it is rooted in traditions that began in South Africa with uh, the minors when they were what's called boot dancing. It was a way for them to communicate and to work with each other while having to work in the lime quarries of South Africa. That tradition then translated to historically black colleges and universities through sororities and fraternities. So we use our STEP team as one way to reinforce our college going culture and to ensure that girls understand that stepping came from sororities and fraternities that were formed on college campuses. So we use our STEP team as another mechanism to support our academic program, 
and ensuring that our girls have at least a 2.0 grade point average. And if they do not, unfortunately, they cannot participate on the team until they have that average. And then also ensuring that part of being on the team is serving others. So when the team was active, because right now all of our teams are on hiatus, they would definitely support their younger Bliss sisters uh, through tutoring and also through uh, mentoring. So we think of our STEP team as an extension of our school's mission and vision. Wonderful, thank you. Um, are there opportunities for uh, people to see your STEP dance team? Unfortunately, not right now. Uh, the girls, the team is on hiatus because our, all of our teams are on hiatus right now. We are looking to see if we have footage of former uh, or older performances, I'll say that. And Carrie, if we can work together, and Laura, we'll send you some like footage of some, some older performances. But right now, the girls are all on hiatus, so we are anxiously anticipating their return. That's great. Thank you. We, we would really, uh, we would be very happy to post it on our on our uh, YouTube channel. So I have a couple of questions about um, how you recruit and um, uh, maintain your teachers. So, um, so now we are looking at more innovative ways to recruit teachers. So we one we can do national searches. We also work with our professional organizations. And for us, it is the National Council of Girls Schools and the Young Women's Leadership Network. So we are an affiliate school with the Young Women's Leadership Network in New York. Our, our primary recruiting partner is Baltimore City Public Schools because we are a Baltimore City public school. So we work with multiple pipelines to ensure that our girls have teachers in front of them who can meet their needs and also move them forward. Um, how are alumni actively uh, supporting uh, current students? Uh, so have okay. Right now, we have a few of our alumni who are actually, they're in college, but home, if that they're, they're learning from their homes in Baltimore. So we, through another grant, we were able to provide funding for a few of them to serve as tutors for their younger Bliss sisters in uh, math. So it's a community that they're familiar with. Uh, many of them who are tutors are interested in becoming teachers. And so we found a way to also incentivize them. So how can we help them to earn money while they're at home? while helping their Bliss sisters and also learning what we call the other side of teaching. So they just, they saw teaching from what they experienced with us. But if you're really interested in teaching, let's go on the other side and look at the lesson planning and questioning and checks for understanding. And if I could just add to that too, we are, um, as Siobhan said earlier, our first class graduated in 2016. So we're starting to build, you know, and some of those girls have graduated from college now. So we are working on an alumni engagement strategy to also involve them to support the school, um, both philanthropically teaching them because that's what leaders do and leaders in the community support through their time, talent and treasure. So we, we have them um, tutoring in time and talent and we will talk to them about treasure and just build that over the years so that we can have a solid foundation of our alumni supporting the school in multiple ways. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that uh, all of your fifth grade girls uh, are put into a lottery. Uh, the question is, do girls need to meet specific academic requirements to qualify for the lottery? No. So we don't see their grades, report cards, standardized test scores until after they are admitted. Wonderful. And then if, uh, if they are admitted with low scores, do they uh, have additional chances or opportunities for mentorship and tutoring? Yes. So right now we are looking at how we can make that possible in this setting. So one of the ways that we are considering is we have an incoming, what we would call an orientation week our program for our incoming sixth graders, but how do we expand that program to ensure that not only are we working on 
uh, social and emotional supports, but really diving deeper into the academic needs of our incoming sixth grade students, particularly with a focus on math. Well, I think that's all of the questions in the chat thus far. Um, I will give all of the, the women on the meeting a, a minute to go ahead and type more questions. Um, Laura, I, I put one in for um, oh. Siobhan to answer. Oh, okay. okay. So one question that has come up is to definitely talk about the support of the Baltimore Women's Lit Giving Circle, excuse me, to our school. And so as I've said, through this support, we are able to do things that no other Baltimore City school is able to do with their, public school is able to do with their students. So that one piece, as we share it with Tamara Hamilton's story, is allowing students, like I said, many of whom are first generation, to see that college campus for the first time. Uh, we know that in other communities, families typically, they'll go on college tours uh, with their students after they're accepted. But for some of the girls in our community, all families are not able to make trips to respective college campuses while the, their daughter is waiting to make that decision. So we allow our girls to take what we call the first look visit. And that's when our uh, director of college counseling, when she uh, travels with, uh, with some of our seniors to see that campus, right? To talk to. And I'll just jump in while <laughs> school is buzzing, but we have, heard from alums who say, you know, one of the pieces of the first look is removing barriers for girls who, for example, may be first generation college students and leaving home for the first time, especially if they're going as far as Little Rock, Rock Arkansas, or, um, or even, even Philadelphia. So a train ride away, but, but not home. Um, so we want to make sure that they have a comfort level and feel confident that they can live independent from their family. And we want to, to help remove that barrier. And those first look college tours are critical for that. And we've heard from uh, alumni, including Tamira, who've said that. Um, so that, that's, that removes that. And the dual, the dual enrollment program, so they're comfortable in a college class. So they're going to a college class and then coming back to school where they're familiar. So that builds their confidence and comfort level. So the, that when they're sitting in their first college class as a freshman, they aren't, it's not completely new to them. Thank you, Carrie. And I, I want to just underscore that the support from uh, the Baltimore Women's Giving Circle, it supports all of our students. So I know you hear us talking about our seniors or talking about our alumni, but when we think about the girl who comes to us in sixth grade, right? And it has happened. Families have said, you know, this is a great school, but I cannot afford the uniform. So it is from the entry point at the sixth grade when we're, we don't want there to be any barrier to your coming to our school. If you believe that your daughter would benefit and would grow from being here, we will help with the rest. And when we say we, mean we mean you too, because you have supported more families than you know, even if it's with helping a family to buy a polo sh uniform shirt. And um, we've had families who just couldn't afford the tights or the socks and things like that. So those are the ways that your, your, your excuse me, your philanthropy supports our entire school before they get to college, once they're in college, and uh, you continue to help us to be the helicopter school, as they say so often, through our alumni support, through our alumni support program. Wonderful. And we have one last question. Um, do you have learning specialist and counselor? Yes. So we have a full, uh, what we call a mental health suite. Our mental health suite includes a full-time school counselor, a full-time school social worker. We have a school psychologist who is with us three days a week. And we also have an additional partner. 
unconditional partnership with Roberta's house, I think she was going to say. <laughs> um, well, the bell's done sounding maybe, but yes. And we do. Go ahead, Carrie. You go. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> and our additional partnership with uh, Hope Health Systems. So through Hope Health Systems, we have an additional clinician who comes into our building. She's here, uh, well, when we're in session, she's here every day. And she helps students to receive what we call therapeutic services. So, so often we would have students that would have to leave school to go to therapy, thus missing learning time. So we thought, what if we just bring a therapeutic clinician here and they can receive their services at school? And uh, she works with their families to uh, receive their medical insurance information so that they can be billed that way. That way we are once again reducing uh, that barrier that many families experience, particularly students, as they're thinking about how do I continue to have my mental health needs met as well. And uh, yet another question, uh, can you discuss some of the uh, other sources of your funding? Sure. I I, yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you for that question. Yes, so we generally look at our funding um, from three main sources, so individuals, and that includes our board. So our board is very philanthropic, and we have board giving at 100%. Um, also, other people connected to our board um, make donations or people we've solicited in ter because of their interests, their specific interests in education or some of the, the um, initiatives that we've undertaken over the years. We also get support from other uh, foundations. So I start, I'm very new to Bliss. I started at the end of August um, and we have uh, a contractor who's helping us write with grant writing and we have probably written nine grants in uh, six months. Um, so we have funding from all kinds of foundation sources and, or we apply for it, including the state um, as well as local foundations, um, and then corporations. So we have other funds from corporations. And a lot of that, a lot of the corporate giving is in connection with our uh, breakfast every year. So I know many of you have come to our Empower Breakfast, which was virtual this year in October. It usually is in the spring, but we're actually moving it to the fall, and it is virtual. So we have sponsorships for that. And that has been, that event has grown every year. So this was the, started in 2014. So it was the sixth year we've done it. Um, and it has grown year over year. And this year we raised a little more than $475,000. So that's, that's from individuals and sponsorships primarily. And that includes um, ticket sales and day of donations. So so those are, that's a, an overview of our other sources of funding. And yes, the documentary step on Amazon is the one about us. So I, I recently rewatched it. I'd seen it several years ago. Um, but when I have not been in the building when the girls have been in person in session and I felt lonely for them. So I watched it like back in September when school was starting. and It renewed my um, connection with some of the girls, even though the girls who's featured or have graduated. Well, thank you so very much to both of you uh, for coming to speak with us and to tell us about the school and your amazing young women. Um, we really, really appreciate all of your time. And uh, uh, well, um, sometimes there's technology glitches. And so we'll just move on forward. Um, and I'm going to turn the meeting over to Leslie Glickman to give you a couple of um, announcements and to close out. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, Carrie. And thanks, Emily, for, the, for this very enlightening program. We will definitely follow up. You'll get the, the link to the video of this production within the next couple of weeks. And if there are any other uh, components of uh, Siobhan's talk that we can send electronically with their permission, we will also do that as well. It's quite a special program and I think we should really feel proud that we've helped to make it continue over 
of quite a long period of time, particularly in a challenging uh, climate that we have and a lot of competition for grants, tremendous amount of competition for grants. We look forward to seeing you later in the month for the full circle meeting. We have an outstanding speaker, Dr. Lawrence Brown, who will be speaking about the black butterfly. If you have the opportunity to review his book prior to the meeting on the 17th, I would highly recommend it. It is a real eye opener. Coming, getting through the first half of it sets the stage for our history of how we came to where we are today. The second half of the book, he lays out a potential solution and opportunities. So it does leave us on a positive note. The other uh, meeting coming up in April will be Circle Reads, and we'll be reviewing Kanwan B. Fidel's new book, The Anti-Racist, and he will be joining us for that discussion. So please mark your calendar. You will have plenty of notice on these events. We will send out the links a couple of times in case um, you might have missed them. We're all uh, so active in the community that we have lots going on all the time. And it really helps to have the link a couple of days before. So you can expect an announcement and then two to three days before yet another announcement with a link. If it bothers you having those additional links, uh, do let us know and we'll see if we can um, opt you out. But I think for most of us, it's been extremely helpful. We apologize for any technological problem. It was certainly unplanned, unintentional, and we were not able to really totally resolve it. But thanks to Bond for working with us and Carrie. Ladies, good to see you. Stay safe. Enjoy the beautiful weather. And we look forward to seeing you soon.